Okay, I, I work for NRCS, that's the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm almost positive everybody but two or three in this room knows what we do, and so for those two or three, I'll tell you what we do. We were formed back in the Dust Bowl times to solve the bus, uh, Dust Bowl problem because that was a resource issue. And uh, mm -hmm. since then, we've gotten different assignments. We have to keep track of dust still and water erosion. We also have been handed uh, water quantity, you know, uh, more uh, efficient irrigation systems, and then water quality, which is what this is about. And in the past couple of years, we've been handed also air quality and energy. We try to hire the appropriate people to solve those kind of issues as the time comes on. Uh, right now, we're kind of struggling because they handed the air quality stuff to an agronomist. I don't know much about air quality, but I know if you can't see through it, it it's uh, probably got a problem. And if you can taste it, that's a bigger problem. But anyway, that's kind of who we are. We write from the national office, they sit down with the, the universities and the scientists around and develop uh, uh, standards to like solve uh, wind erosion or water erosion. In this case, they developed a standard uh, to solve nutrient management problems. What we write in the standard is uh, a way so that you can comply. If you go with the standard, you will not have a problem with EPA because we've got a plan takes care of that for the EPA issues. So that's kind of our role is uh, uh, we don't invent the policies but we have to figure out how to tackle it, how to, how to crunch it down and make it possible. And so we've got some pretty sharp people. Uh, we've got some uh, engineer over here uh, and some uh, soil conservationists and, and they, they write the plans that we've been talking about. Now, you've talk, uh, we talked about in, in this, the past few years, we've really emphasized, you know, what's going on at your headquarters. Whether there's water uh, leaving the, the bottom of your corral, getting into a stream or getting into groundwater or any of those issues. Another side of that is what's, getting, uh, what's leaving your fields. And that's what I'm uh, going to talk about is uh, the, app the risk of manure leaving your fields. Okay, I can I can talk a little bit about the the 590 standard. Uh, yeah, but I, it's too small for me, for me to read. Okay, so the 590 standard. What uh, in the past we've had what we call the Utah Manure Application Rin Risk Index, and when we get this running, uh, I'll kind of go through that. And what that does, it gives you a chance to rate each field, so you can locate the ones that are a problem and not apply during the winter especially because you know you, you put uh, manure on a field that's going to slope right into the creek you know the manure is just going to get come right down with the, with the water when it melts in the spring so we, we rated each field based on that amount of risk and we've got different factors that we look at to do that so that was an agreement between NRCS the Department of Environmental Quality and Utah State University uh, when we built that and we decided we had a good tool that was workable and we could make it work in Utah. Now most of the people that have got a comprehensive nutrient management plan have, have had each field rated with that Utah Man App Application Risk Index. We call it UMARI that's because it makes me stutter to try to say the other part. Looks like we're going okay. Okay the clicker's not going then. Okay so New standard doesn't allow that Umari. Uh, you'll have to back it up one. Okay, the, the idea is, and I, you guys are sensible people, the idea is you put manure on the field, you want it to stay there. You want the nutrients to get into the ground where it'll do some good. You don't want them to go too far deep because then it's out of the re re reach of your crop roots. And so you just want to have manure go where you put it. There's a couple ways manure can move. One way is uh, you put it on and it blows off. If you can see this picture, this is down in Clearfield after a windy day. The sand in the field is blown right up over the road. And before the sand moved, the manure moved. And so that wind took the manure that he applied on that field and, it, and he shared it with all of his neighbors. Now, I don't know whether his neighbors were happy about that or whether they weren't. Personally, I think they should have been happy because manure is an important nutrient 
It's got good things in it. It would have made their lawn grow better, but people can take exception to that, and if you put something on somebody else's property that they don't want, you're liable for it. We haven't solved the manure blowing issue. I don't know how to do that one yet, but most of the nutrients that leave the field wash off. They'll either wash down through the soil or wash off the end in surface water, and that's the stuff that we look at the most. Now, I talked about the UMARI, the Utah Manure Application Risk Index, and we've got different assessment factors, and I'm going to go through a whole list of them until you're sick of hearing about them. Then I'll uh, look at the whole total, the list of them all, and how we total it up. One of the things we look at is the distance to water. Here's a nice cornfield. You can see the corn right in here. They've got a little drain down, going down through the field. It's a natural drain. Uh, when they irrigate, a little of that water, about 20% of the water, which is normal for a good irrigation, goes across that field and gets down into the drain and has to be carried out into the, into the river system. And you can see this drain, that isn't, that, that isn't paint, asphalt painted green, that's just water. It's got a good uh, film of duckweed over the top of it. Duckweed, I really don't have a lot of complaint about. Ducks love to eat it. Uh, it's good nutrients, but it's an indicator that there's a lot of nutrients in that water. That water isn't nice, clear, and sparkly clean. It's got a lot of stuff in it. And so that's an indicator there's a lot of nutrients in that water. All you have to do is look around and say, where did those nutrients f come from? And you don't really have to guess. You know where it came from. So the distance to water. If, if a place is... Uh, Right next to the field or ditch, we give that a nine. We give it nine points, and we say that's a high-risk field. If it's more than a thousand feet away from a water or ditch, we don't think the water is really going to get down into that drain, and so we give it a point and a half. And at the end of this, we're going to tally all those points and, and decide if it's a good field to spread on in the winter or not. How, then at each one of these factors, I'm going to look at how do you change it, how do you manage it. One thing is uh, with the management is put a setback. So you may have the edge of the field, but you'd, you're going to, uh, when you spread manure, you're going to stay back 50 feet from the edge of the field. So the stems of the crop, the grass that's going on the side of the, of the field, <coughs> filter that manure out and clean the water up before it gets into the, into the water body. And that's going to be, of course, a function of slope. So if it's a steep slope, uh, you can have a short distance. If it's a really, I mean, if it's a steep slope, that's <laughs> four to five percent, you need to be far away because the water will come through there faster. If it's a flat slope, you can be closer. Those are just kind of make sense sort of thing. Yes, question. No. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, you'll, you'll, see these, uh, you'll see these numbers right there in a column, and you'll see this distance to water in a column. That, that, that's the part you'll see. Okay, the, the structures that you can, you can do to take care of that distance to water, uh, somebody already mentioned them. He's put dikes around his field. He's going to just keep the, the water and the manure there. Another way to do that is a pump back system. If water was expensive and scarce, we would be taking water when it runs off the end of the field, gathering it up, pumping it right back up to the head of the field, and run it through again until it is all soaked in. And it might take a couple of trips if it's a field with a... They do that in Colorado down around Rocky Ford area. Uh, they do it in quite a few places in California because their water is really precious and expensive. So uh, here, you know, we, we, we say that it's precious and expensive, but it, we, we're not going to that extreme yet. So that's something to look, for, look to do in the future. You can see how that would keep the water from going off down into the stream because you're getting it to soak into the ground. A another one is the irrigation type. Uh, you can do irrigation water management and then you can put in pivots and wheel lines and things like that. Now, a high risk would be an uncontrolled flood system. That's where uh, my daddy, that's the way my daddy taught me to irrigate, where you dig a ditch and you go down the top of the ridge uh, when the water goes in, it kind of goes into the sides, into the bottoms. Then you dig another ditch and bring it back up on top of the ridge. You haven't done any land leveling, but you've done a lot of shoveling or, or pulled a lot of ditch with a tractor. 
uh, that that's a good way to irrigate, but it's a very very labor intensive, and uh, you get one generation down, and they forget that you have to maintain those ditches, and pretty soon they're just water in the bottoms. So uncontrolled is a high risk. The very best would be a sprinkler system or a level basin. A level basin, uh, when I say level ba basin, what I want you, th you to think is rice paddy. It's, it's got a dike around the whole, all four sides of it. You fill it up with water and you let it soak in. Uh, a graded border is got a little bit of water that comes off the end, so it's not a level basin, but it's a dang good irrigation system. Then flood irrigation, that's a medium risk. So we've given points, assigned points to each of those. Now here's my picture. Is that a good irrigation system or a bad one? I hear some people saying it's good and I agree with you. What I, I see... whether you put manure on that in the... <laughs> <laughs> good point. What, you, what you're seeing is water that's pretty well ponded. It's flat across that whole field. I'll bet it's two inches deep. The reason why I say two inches is that's wheat growing there, and I, I see about six inches of it sticking out in the far corner up in there, and down in here it's about the same. So they've got it spread across there. It's a tight soil, and that, that soil isn't taking the water very fast. So what they do with a system like this is they'll fill it up maybe two inches deep, then go fill up the next one and the next one, and maybe in 12 hours, 24 hours, that water has soaked down two feet deep. Two inches will go about two feet and deep. Sun bakes it, you'd like to <laughs> I I hope not. I hope we can come back and irrigate it again. Um, so when you when you do that, you irrigate right to the root zone. The crop is able to utilize whatever nutrients were put on there. And then when you've got it contained with a dike like that, there's no runoff. So you know, in a perfect world, this would be the way we we're trying to get it isn't a perfect world. Cache County is very close to being perfect, but you've got slopes. And so it's very difficult to find a place where you can put a dead level field. So it does work down around uh, Delta, down that lake bed country where things are just perfectly flat. Cover type. This is one, one of the things that you can use uh, to look at. And that is uh, you change it by getting as much cover on the field as long as you can. And cover, uh, a high risk field would be smooth bare ground all the way through the winter. So you've plowed it, dissed it, you've harrowed it, you've land planed it and rolled it, and then it's going to sit from there clear until spring and then you'll plant it. In, in that kind of a situation, it's really open for a lot of erosion and the manure will move what it, where, whenever the soil will move. So that's a high risk. A low risk is a good stand of grass. Lots of stems or alfalfa is the same way. Lots of stems standing up to hold that in place. When the crop is actively growing, it'll pull the nutrients right out of the manure. If it's not growing, the nutrients can come down through the soil past the plants because they're not woken up and grabbing that, the nutrients. So if the water doesn't go too, too deep, nutrients are staying in the root zone, you're just fine. Uh, you can't put structures in to solve a cover problem. You just put in grass or, or get a good crop to stay in there. Uh, low risk would be grain stubble or, or really rough ground. A medium risk, corn stubble, because there's just not much there. There's not many stems that are standing up through there. <coughs> Runoff containment, it's, uh, that's the same kind of term as we were thinking about when you're looking around a, a feedlot. You don't want water running on and you don't want, want rudder, water running off. If you have uh, water running into your feedlot, that's more water than you ha have to deal with. So it's better to have a diversion or a dike around the top of it, uh, and the same around the bottom. You want to catch that water and hold it before it goes, moves off your property and get, uh, causes somebody a problem. So th that can be a true of a field. So a high-risk field, it flows directly to water, a stream, or, or whatever, or off your property, that's a high risk. A lo very low risk would be it's fully contained for a 10-year, 24-hour storm event. We call that a threshold storm event because for some reason we picked that and we said, okay, that's the number. If you go above it, uh, if there's, you get a bigger event than that, no one's going to come after you unless you don't have a permit. 
But if you have uh, less than that, uh, you're okay. You're, you're designed to take care of it. Uh, engineers, uh, how, how, how much water in Cache Valley is a 25-year, 24-hour storm event? Okay, uh, do you think it's maybe a foot of water, a foot of rain in 24 hours? Okay, let's back off that a little bit. I think it's around two and a half inches or so. As a matter of fact, if this is on a field, two and a half inches will soak right into the ground in a 24 hour period. Most of the, even the tight soils will take about half an inch an hour. Um, the question was, even when it's already saturated, the answer is yes, unless you've got something inside the soil that's stopping it. Um, leaky troughs and broker, broken water lines in the corrals are something to watch to keep from having uh, too much water to deal with. On your place in the fields, uh, we're talking again about those ditches and diversions around the high side. In other states, in California, for example, when they've got uh, runoff that comes off the field, they have legal liability for whatever's in that water. Well, if they just sprayed atrazine on there and there's, you know that their atrazine is going to be in the water, that causes a problem if you're going to discharge it back into a river. And so they look at, at the bottom of, of a field, they'll put a little evaporation pond and they'll evaporate the water away, the, the runoff kind of water. Uh, another thing that uh, is an emerging issue for us, and I don't know how to solve it yet entirely, is the water that comes through your field drains, that's also water that leaves your field. So if you irrigate and then all of a sudden the next day, the water in your field drains have got high nitrate in it or have washed a lot of pesticide through, that's uh, not good. So we try to avoid that. And, and so w a along with a nutrient management plan, we'll look at managing field drains and figure out what we can do. Uh, there are soil limitations. Uh, so the question is, uh, how, how much water can that soil take? If it's a good deep soil, five feet of good uh, loamy soil, you put water on it and it takes it, uh, you can put 10 inches of water and it'll soak in that five feet and not drip out the bottom. Conversely, on the other hand, if you've got a high water table, the water doesn't have anywhere to go but into that water table, and the water table moves over into the uh, two places, into the groundwater, into the wells, uh, so it can get into drinking water, and it al also can seep into your drains or seep into the streams as it goes by, so that groundwater can, can be a problem. Then another one would be uh, if you've got a hard pan area, you know, there's a lot of country around here that you go down about 12 inches and all of a sudden you've got a solid hard pan that the water won't go through. Well, then you've only got this much soil to work with instead of that five feet. And the other things are things like gravel and bedrock and sandy layers, that kind of stuff. So if it, uh, those can limit the amount of storage capacity or the ability for that to sponge up the water that you put on it, especially after you've put on new manure because you want it to stay. If it's a deep soil, greater than five feet deep. We'll only give it a point and a half. A high-risk soil would be less than two feet deep. So it's shallow to gravel or, or something like that. That'd be a high risk. Can't do anything about it. Uh, that's just uh, a soil is a soil. And uh, so that's one of those places where you'd identify this field and say, you know, this is a place to be pretty careful when I apply manure. I'll do it. Uh, when I know it's not going to rain, you know, I'll do it when, when it's going to be a good situation for the water to be, just go into the root zone and no further. Okay, field drains can change it, and for the better or the worse, they can do both. So, uh, if you've got a high water table, you put it in the field drains, it makes it so you can farm the ground, but they'll also bring those nutrients on through and, and could cause... Uh, 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 discharge. Okay, there's the scientific part. Soil hydrologic groups, and that is the texture of the soil. Everybody knows that a clay soil, water doesn't flow down through it very well. So if you had a clay field and, you, and a rain came, the water's going to run off. A sandy soil takes water really well, and so the same amount of rain comes, 
will, it just soaks in. And so we have a rating for, uh, for those hydrologic groups. So if it's A, a well-drained sand and gravel, very high permeability, that's, that's something where it's very low risk of runoff. Now I have to remember that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that this is of runoff. Uh, a high risk would be a type D where it's poorly drained clay soil. It's going to have a lot of runoff. Now you turn that around and start looking at going down into the water table, getting into the groundwater, uh, causing problems in a well. These uh, sand and gravels with high permeability are not really as good as, as you'd think. But we've ra ranked this particular thing just on runoff, and we ignored groundwater. Uh, and that may be a mistake. Uh, slope, if it's slopey, as we talked before, it's a high risk. If it's a, if it's a flat slope, it's a low risk. Can't change it, uh, but things you can do are careful irrigation water management. Now, what I'm saying is, if it's slopey ground, you're never going to be putting on a, a, a border system because it just doesn't work. Or uh, one of those uh, rice paddy uh, basins. Those won't work either on a slope. So what you're really talking about is sprinkler systems. So if you put the sp design the sprinkler system so that the water is applied just a little bit slower than the maximum intake of that soil, it'll never puddle and it'll never run. It just goes in. Uh, things that you can do are put in grass strips and terraces and dikes and all those <coughs> things, uh, check dams. And I talked about setbacks before. Now to increase the water, soil water holding capacity, you can do things to increase that. Now everybody here I'm hoping is a farmer that you can put, uh, pull back a spade full of dirt, you pull that up and you look at it, if it's black and crumbly and, and those little BB sized granules are hard and strong. You look at them, there's uh, root hairs all over them and there's fungus uh, all over them. That is a good soil and it'll hold a tremendous amount of water. Uh, conversely, you can till the life out of a soil till it has none of those features and it doesn't hold as much water. The organic matter really helps it hold water. Apply manure adds to the organic matter. And, and just having good crops adds the organic matter in the soil. So you can improve the soil condition. That's how you change it. You can't help it with structures. We've got points for water holding capacity. Now, what I'm talking about here is, let's say that you were in Vernal, Utah, where there was uh, seven, seven inches of rain a year. Five of those inches came in the winter, and you had a good deep soil that was five feet deep. All of that water could soak in, and it'll never even wet down two feet. And so those guys have to, to even start in the spring, they need to fill up their soil water profile. Well, you think about, you know, apply manure or you apply uh, nutrients onto a field like that. During the winter, it just isn't going to soak in too deep. Conversely, here, uh, you've got a, a good winter precip here. I, and I can't tell you what it is, but let's say that during winter time you get 10 inches of rain. And what if the soil is one that doesn't really hold too much water? Let's say it held two inches of water. You put 10 inches of rain and it only holds two inches, it's going to wash that manure, the nutrients, down through the root zone, get it down into the groundwater, and that's a problem. We rated that. Uh, if it's uh, the adjusted water holding capacity is low, we assign three points to it. If it's high, we say it's, and that's how we got at that level. And uh, you don't have to have that memorized, so don't, I, I don't do math, I'm an agronomist. Incorporation of manure. What that means is uh, if you can get it into the ground so it doesn't run off, uh, it's going to be where it belongs and it's not going to move. So to uh, incorporate manure, my favorite way, uh, the way I do on my place, I'm, uh, my place is down in Sampeet County and I get turkey manure and I put it on maybe uh, three passes and then I'll move the hand line on my place over onto where I just put manure. 
Well, it's going to dissolve whatever uh, nitrogen was in the form of ammonia or nitrate and take it into the ground. It's going to bring the phosphorus that's free and take it into the ground. So if you can incorporate it just as quick as you can after you apply it, you're getting more of the good from the manure, more of the nutrients. And it decreases, since, it's, since, since the nutrients are in the soil, they're not running off the end of the field. So you can sprinkle it in like I'm talking in because I'm phobic about cul uh, cultivating it. You can inject it. Uh, here's a picture of a pivot and he's sprinkling the manure in. This is an injector system. Uh, I, I know that there's a hog, manure, a hog farmer in here somewhere. And these are good systems for hog farmers. Cause what, uh, everybody complains about hog manure. Why is that? I don't know, but they say that it stings. Uh, cow manure they're not as sensitive about and poultry manure stinks too but what this is is you've got uh, shanks behind the tank and they put those shanks in and then they pump in right behind the shanks as you go along so it puts that manure down eight inches down in a slot the slots close in behind it and it, it uh, is down where it can't get away the only problem with that to me is that it looks kind of expensive and takes a lot of energy to pull those shanks through and it's a little bit tough to pull through a crop but uh, you know maybe they can figure that part out I'm sure they have in a few places then the other way is just to disc it in or whatever tillage you want to what, what you want to do now a high risk system was if you never incorporate it it sits on the surface of the ground and just stays there waiting for water to wash it into the creek the very best a very low risk would be it's injected or incorporated right at the time of application. Like when I talked, I, I put the manure out and then I sprinkle it in. Uh, in between things, a low risk would be, you know, you get it with, you're, you're going to disc it in within a week. You've only lost half of the nitrogen in the manure, but half is better than all of it. If it's uh, incorporated within three months by tillage or irrigation, that's a medium risk. Can't really do that with structures. Can anyone in this room tell me what that green gizzy is? That's a, that's a soil moisture sensor. And it helps you get better irrigation efficiency by sensing how hard the water is being held by the soil. So if you've just irrigated, the soil doesn't really have much of a hold on that water. Uh, it's free and the, the plant roots can grab that water and use it. The more water that's used out of the soil, the harder that soil has a hold on it till it gets to the point that the plants can't pull the water away from the soil. It's there, but they can't pull it away. And that's when they start to wilt down, and sometimes they'll die. This measures that tension that the soil holds on the water. And it's a, a good tool. It's a technology that we use now. Uh, and we're trying to get pe more people to use it all the time. It keeps you from letting your crop get too, too dry. It also keeps you from over watering it when the soil profile is already full. If you're doing good irrigation efficiency, let's say a high risk is less than 40%. That means when you put the water out there, 60% of the water runs off the end or goes into the groundwater. A, a very low risk would be greater than 60% efficiency. That would be like a sprinkler system. They're around 65% efficient. Pivots, maybe 90 and then just uh, medium risk, low risk, we've got different numbers for those. So you, you uh, do irrigation water management with tools. Okay, Th uh, this is the page that you're all looking at on your, in your packet. All those numbers that I talked about are in this column here. So the distance for that particular field, field number one of track 2940, I don't know whose this is, but uh, the distance from water, they had six points. In the irrigation type, they only had three because they had a good irrigation type. Cover type, it was uh, corn silage, so it was at six points. Containment, they got nine points because it was not contained at all on that field. Uh, restrictive layer, they got three points. Hydrologic group, three points. Percent slope, it was sloping, so they got a percent and a half. Adjusted water holding capacity uh, was pretty close to the winter precip, and so they got two points. Total that all up, and they got 34 and a half 
points. Doesn't mean a thing unless you assign some meaning to it. We assigned that, that 34 and a half means that it's a medium risk field. You look at another field over here that doesn't have uh, as high of a risk. In this one, the difference between this field and that field is containment. This one has no containment. This one has it contained, and it's a low-risk field. Only got 26 and a half points. So that's how we total all this stuff up. Uh, and that's, that's the Umari. What, we've been using that for about 10 years, and we, uh, uh, we'll, as the things are written, written right now in the draft nutrient management standard, which the comment period is over tomorrow, <laughs> Uh, we will not be able to use this. We will not be able to apply on the, in the winter. Uh, there's a slip in your paper inviting you to comment on the federal register. You can do it with email. You can just send a, a letter in. Uh, and that's about it. Questions?